Have you ever wondered why Tokyo Disney stands out with incredible design? This is Tokyo Disney Sea, the best park in the whole world. The entrance to the park is like a real city. It even features a full working hotel. The icon of the park erupts in incredible design. This volcano features a high-tech ride and an immersive land. From outstanding rides to incredible landscapes, there's something about Japanese theme parks that stand out. Let's find out why Japanese theme parks are incredibly well designed. Well, surprisingly, when Tokyo Disneyland opened in 1983, it was in fact not outstanding. In fact, Tokyo Disneyland almost didn't exist. Our story begins when Oriental Land Company was born. Their goal? Reclaim the sea of Urayasu, not only for commercial and residential development, but also for a grand recreational facility. Little did they know, this ordinary concept would lay the foundation for what we know today as Tokyo Disney Resort. This process would however not be easy, it included tiresome hours of negotiation with the government and fishermen. With agreements in place, Oriental Land embarked on a monumental task of offshore reclamation in Urayasu, but an idea emerged, what if this land could be used for a Disneyland park? The 70s were a hard time for Disney, they were focusing on building Epcot, so a rare opportunity emerged. After long and tiresome negotiations, Oriental Disneyland came to be. But how would the park actually look like? Well, Imagineers were busy realizing Walt's dream with Epcot. This massive project required a lot of work. So Oriental Disneyland, now Tokyo Disneyland, would basically just be a copy and paste of Disneyland and the Magic Kingdom with some really questionable decisions. So let's explore Tokyo Disneyland. Let's start with the entrance. Imagineers were faced with a challenge. Because of the weather, they opted for a covered entrance. This was originally going to be themed to different countries and would feature more brutalist aesthetics. However, a more standard Main Street came to be World Bazaar. This allows for shoppers to seamlessly hop from shop to shop while staying safe from the weather. Additionally came a genius decision. The side streets connect to the other lands for better crowd control. Then the parade would also not flow through World Bazaar, again for better crowd control. But this comes at a price, both financially and aesthetically. The facades look less lively with this green thing standing out. It takes you out of the immersion for an instant. There is also a big positive that I don't see many people talking about. It allows for great landscaping. What do I mean by that? Well, this view of the castle is great. It is what Gordon Cullen calls here and beyond. The park would also feature some weird creative choices. Tomorrowland would feature the classics from Disneyland and Walt Disney World. In fact, Tomorrowland at Tokyo Disneyland feels like a trip back in time because it is basically the same as Walt Disney World used to be. They made the wise decision to align Space Mountain with the center of Tomorrowland, creating nice viewpoints. The park would also feature a short skyway, leading to Fantasyland, featuring the rides you would expect, like Dumbo, It's a Small World and Haunted Mansion. Wait, what is Haunted Mansion doing right next to It's a Small World? Well, Imagineers thought it would make more cultural sense to put Haunted Mansion in Fantasyland, despite creating some odd viewpoints and contrasting with It's a Small World. After all, Haunted Mansion has its American colonial facade that contrasts with medieval European Fantasyland. Frontierland would also not be called that, rather Westernland but it was still very similar. Adventureland would also feature the classics from Disneyland and Walt Disney World. There would be a New Orleans Square, missing some buildings, Jungle Cruise, Swiss Family Treehouse and a Tiki Room. What would make Tokyo Disneyland different is the railroad. Because of Japanese laws, the railroad would only have one stop and in fact it doesn't run a full loop. Instead, it travels through Adventureland and Westernland. This is Western River Railroad. More on it later. Meanwhile, many have pondered, would a Disney park outside the United States work? After all, this was the first park to be built outside the US, featuring the classic Disney characters. Were these ideas incompatible with other cultures? Tokyo Disneyland was a massive success. By 1984, it had welcomed more than 10 million guests. Disney creatives 
not only learned their designs could work outside the United States, but also their creations impressed Japanese guests, showing the potential the park had. This marked a slow but important shift. 1986 marked the opening of Big Thunder Mountain. By that time it was the best Big Thunder. In Walt Disney World and Disney Night, Big Thunder is located on the side. It's not an icon of the land when you first enter it. However, at Tokyo Disneyland, Big Thunder Mountain is right at the end of this pathway. But that's not all. Big Thunder features great interaction with the railroad. Look at how the Big Thunder layout communicates with said railroad. And it gets even better. Big Thunder at Tokyo Disneyland features many details that make the ride better. It is very impressive and a testament to good design. This began a trend that over time would become more noticeable. New clones from the US parks looked slightly better than their American counterparts. Let's take a look at Star Tours. It features this massive imposing hangar style building with the walkways and elevated pathways. It creates kinetic energy and gives that sci-fi look. This new expansion in Tomorrowland also saw cooler environments like Pan Galactic Pizza, a great example of creativity and attention to detail. But one of the most impressive clones of a ride is Splash Mountain. First off is the interaction with the railway. It creates a pleasant aesthetic and one of the best views in the whole park. The train creates a captivating look. This composition works well because it features multiple levels but one focal point, with the logs going down the hill. The land is also full of incredible details everywhere you go, making you feel as if you entered the world of these small creatures. Additionally, there's a great restaurant here, Grandma Sarah's Kitchen, with the same elements I described early. So why is Splash Mountain at Tokyo Disneyland such a creative success? Well, because of the attention to detail that went into it, the incredible layers woven into the design that creates great perspectives. By this time it became clear Tokyo Disneyland was a massive success that would last for generations, so it came time to develop a sequel, a second park. But what would it be? Well, maybe a studios park where you could experience the movies like at Walt Disney World. Well, this idea would evolve into Tokyo Disney Sea. Japan would have its own unique Disney park. Tokyo Disney Resort has an advantage. It's located right next to the sea. So why not take full advantage of that and develop a park about the history, the legends, the myths of how we conquered the seas. Mediterranean Harbor features impressive architecture from all over Italy, telling the story about merchants that set sail to the high seas. It also includes a full working hotel, Miracosta, taking inspiration from Disneyland Hotel in Paris. Miracosta is massive, it encompasses many parts of the land, allowing for different room views. The lobby is mega impressive, featuring artwork depicting the ports of call from the park. This hotel is great because it blends renaissance, Italian culture and Disney theming in a fun way. The incredible design of Tokyo Disney Sea was all possible thanks to the creative lead of creative executives like Steve Kirk and his incredible team. It was perfect timing with great people coming together. Mediterranean Harbor also features great views of Mount Prometheus, a volcano that houses Disney's best land. Mysterious Island, transporting guests into Nemo's hideout. Imagineers integrated special effects to the land with smoke and water effects giving guests the illusion that the volcano is very much active. And the boats also pass through giving some good kinetic energy. Tokyo Disney Shi also needs to reinvent the classics. It needs new original rides. Two of these came from Jules Verne ideas. Journey to the center of the earth which reutilizes test track ride system to create a high tech thrill ride and 20,000 leagues under the sea, which gives guests the illusion they are underwater, and also to search for treasure with a searchlight, meaning you need to ride this ride multiple times to catch everything. The park is also laid out in a loop, meaning that after you explored every land you have set sail across the seven seas. But the park also features clever shortcuts behind the volcano, solving one of the downsides of loop designs. The park features many ports of call. One of these is Arabian coast, creating captivating compositions with imposing Middle Eastern architecture and small tight streets. This land has a fruitful program featuring carousel, theater and a major boat ride, 
the park's answer to It's a Small World. Originally, it tried to tell the story of Sinbad, but it was later reworked to make it more friendly to guests, introducing Chun Du, an instant theme park classic. And also Simba lost his beard. The park then invites you into a lost world, a lost river delta that is, featuring Indiana Jones, a clone from Disneyland, telling a different story with Central American culture. The land also features a lot of detail with the boats, the plants, they work together with the architecture to tell a story, as if you are lost in the jungle. Next up is Glacier Bay. Imagineers originally envisioned a port that would be on the cooler side, a mixture of retrofuturismo and glacier expeditions. These plans would later change into port discovery, the Epcot of the seas. The land features a red floor that works like a carpet. It also has great kinetic energy with the railroad, with a smaller but cool detail that many guests don't notice. Look at how the waves are hitting the rocks beneath the railway. Now that's immersion. The architecture is very retro-futuristic, with creative designs that work well. Notice this giant gate that protects the park from the high seas. At least that's what the Imagineers want you to feel, because there is a road right next to it. The land also features a trackless ride, Aquatopia, keep this one in mind for later. American Waterfront features many different themes, from the small New English village with the boats that sway with the waves to the classic lighthouse. This is where you see the other side to American Waterfront, the mega side, from a bustling city to a massive, fake cruise liner. This cruise liner, the Columbia, features a restaurant, for instance, but its purpose is more for aesthetics and storytelling. This land features New York. The Columbia allows guests to feel immersed onto that environment. Of course, New York has a massive cruise liner, so the park needs one. In theme parks, sometimes things don't need to have a massive, extensive program. They just need to tell a story. New York is a city of skyscrapers, so Tokyo Disney Sea also needs one. This came after 2001 with Tower of Terror, utilizing a different story. This time, the park creates captivating view that makes sense in a New York environment. The architecture also connects with the story. It features four bricks, something used back in the day to protect the steel structure from fires, but also utilizes exotic elements from around the world connecting to the story of that attraction. Another later addition is Toyville Trolley Park, bringing guests to the good old days of cable car parks. The Toy Story theme is not overt in its aesthetics, that is, it's not in your face. American Waterfront takes full advantage of the elevated railway. This is one of the most immersive parts of the park, it's like you are really in good old New York. The streets, the cars and even Broadway, they are all there. There is also a mega detailed department store, again combining American and Japanese cultures. So why does Tokyo Disney Sea succeed in so many levels? Well, because of the attention to detail and storytelling, Imagineers already learned from the creative success of Euro Disneyland. They learned that every land needs to have details upon details, and at Tokyo Disney Sea, everything feels explorable. It's not just about the rides, it's about walking around and traveling to a world of fantasy, adventure and excitement. This makes sense once you realize Tokyo Disney Sea was more focused towards adults. This is the park you go for a date. For that, this incredible composition needs to be more apparent. The restaurants need to have great views. Every land needs great landscaping. It's not just about the use of each facility, it's about what it adds to the overall story of the park. Water follows you throughout, and so does the story. Tokyo Disney Sea is one of those parks, the more you learn about it, the more you enjoy it. It's like Tim Kirk said, the levels of detail and story we were able to build in are truly astonishing. Tokyo Disney Sea works well because it transports you into a different world. Every building adds to the story, that's how immersion works. After the success Disney had in Japan, Universal wasn't going to be unchallenged. They were coming to Japan. Unlike the previous park, there would not be an active movie studios. This would be a full-on park, but how could Universal adapt to cater towards the Japanese audience? This would all be possible thanks to the incredible creative leadership of David Burkhardt, John Bardwell and Sharon Spencer. Most of their creative decisions can still be seen to this day. First off, you'll notice how the entrance is 
covered just like Tokyo Disneyland, but it also looks great at night. The creative team did a great job creating new facades for these buildings, because here in Japan there are more Hollywood facades creating a main street-like atmosphere, which is missing from the Florida version. Take a look at the attention to detail. Notice the various architectural styles, Art Nouveau, Spanish Revival and even Art Deco. Just this theater on itself looks impressive. Additionally, at USJ, the studio facades look much more impressive. They have an art modern aesthetic that goes well with the rest of the theme of the park. It solved the problem from previous studios park, where the sound stages were very much function based. Now, the form of the building adds to the theme of the park. Look at the restaurant here, it's not just about the food, it's about Universal's legacy as a company. New York and San Francisco would be basically the same. Sure, the rides are different, but the design was basically the same, with some differences in color. Jurassic Park features different color schemes, much more emphasizing the jungle. When Flying Dinosaur opened, this land became filled with safety nets, unfortunately ruining many landscapes. But it's a good roller coaster, so... In 2024, there is a fun contrast between Water World, which opened with the park, and Super Nintendo World, that came in later, creating a funny view with the apocalyptic aesthetic of Water World and the overall happy aesthetic of Super Nintendo World in the background. Additionally, the park also features its star attraction, Jaws, which still operates. It's a fantastic ride that makes this park even more special. Here, there is this restaurant, which creates a great view of the ride and now Harry Potter. Yes, Harry Potter and Jaws coexist here. Amity Island is great, with New England style architecture and many fun details for the fans to enjoy. Storytelling here extends to the whole land. Next comes an unexpected protagonist, Snoopy. Universal Creatives designed an indoor studio that blows the Cedar Fair parks out of the water. It's a great environment for kids. Originally, USJ had a western area, and it made perfect sense with the theme of the park. However, things would change over time. First came Wicked, and then Sesame Street and Hello Kitty. In fact, if you pay attention, you can see some remnants of the Wild West area. But Universal Studios Japan is also about its high-tech rides. From Space Fantasy to Mario Kart, it also features Hollywood Dream, the ride. Even newer additions like Minion Land works really well, because it has a lot of fun, cool elements. And that's why Universal Studios Japan is the most visited Universal Park. But Oriental Land Company would not be unmatched. With the opening of Tokyo Disney Sea, Imagineers felt Tokyo Disneyland could become less relevant. So a new ride would need to be built, but with Disney owning so many famous intellectual properties, which one would they be? Winnie the Pooh. Eddie Soto recalled how challenging it was to work with such an IP. After all, Winnie the Pooh is a story that can feel a bit boring to some. So why not adapt Aquatopia into a high-tech dark ride? Honey Hunt was born. With the trackless ride technology, they were able to create different experiences for each car. But this innovation didn't stop here. Next up came Monsters Inc. Ride and Seek. It would unfortunately see the closure of Meet the World, which was an original show from the park, but it was replaced with a great experience, where guests interact with the flashlight in an incredible environment. Next up would come a renovation of existing lands, maybe a new fantasy land. The park welcomed its newest addition, replacing the Grand Prix Raceway with this massive expansion. We would see a new area in Tomorrowland, a theater and a Beauty and the Beast dark ride. And yet again, Tokyo Disneyland set out to impress everyone. First is a small French village. The way the buildings are laid out creates breathtaking views. The main attraction is a great example of storytelling. The castle, it looks straight out of the movie. The landscapes complement that. And what about the ride itself? It's a combination of two elements, a traditional show and a dark ride. Each area feels like an act from a performance, but you are fully immersed onto that environment with great animatronics and the trackless dark ride system. It's a great example of something Disney has always been good at, staging. The land also includes a theater. It features four mountains to hide technical elements from the building. Tokyo Disney is known for its great shows, so this place is definitely well utilized. Additionally, this expansion would see some upgrades to Tomorrowland, like Happy Ride with Baymax. 
but what really makes Japanese theme park so special, well, I think it's how they set out to do the impossible. It's a perfect combination of outstanding creative decisions like landscaping, architecture and design combined with guest expectations. Japanese theme parks have to cater to a demanding audience that takes notes of the park's incredible design. Guests in Japan, they do more than riding the rides, so the park's leadership needs to create beautiful landscapes and diverse points of view. Theme parks in Japan like USJ and Tokyo Disney Resort are also known for their modest budgets, allowing for a creative sandbox. So it's a combination of great creative teams and commitment to greatness. It's fun to see how the parks evolved all the way from the 80s as a simple Disneyland park that grew into a fantastic resort. It's like a seed that began mid-side the earth. It grew into a blossoming tree. But what's next? Well, Tokyo Disney is again topping what they have done before with a new expansion coming to Tokyo Disney Sea, Fantasy Springs, coming this year. This land will feature immersive experiences from different Disney adventures, Tangled, Peter Pan and Frozen. This land is also going to feature a new hotel at Tokyo Disney Sea, featuring park view rooms. Tokyo Disney Resort does it again. Tokyo Disneyland is also redoing their space model, replacing the current one. This is part of a plan to revamp Tomorrowland. But now we have a different challenge. As theme parks evolve, they welcome new rides and say goodbye to old ones. But now, Universal Studios Japan and Tokyo Disney Resort face a challenge. Where to expand? This is a challenge current and future generations of Imagineers and creatives will have to solve. Are you going to take on this challenge?